Welcome back to Van's Reading. We're on chapter 35, Two Selves. You know the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Okay, so, chapter 35, Two Selves. The term utility has had two distinct meanings in its long history. Jeremy Bentham opened his introduction to the principles of morals and legislation. With the famous sentence, nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what, she, what we shall do. In an awkward footnote, Bentham apologized for applying the word utility to these experiences, saying that he had been unable to find a better word to distinguish Bentham's interpretation of the term. I will call it experienced utility. For the last hundred years, economists have used the same word to mean something else. As economists and decisions theorists apply the term, it means wantability. And I have called it Decision utility. Expected utility theory, for example, is entirely about the rules of rationality that should govern decision utilities. It has nothing at all to say about hedonic ex experiences. Of course, the two concepts of utility will coincide if people want what they will enjoy and enjoy what they choose for themselves. And this assumption of co coincidence is implicit in the general idea that economic agents and rationale Rational agents are expected to know their tastes, both present and future, and they're supposed to make good decisions that will maximize these interests. My fascination with the oh, sorry, experienced utility. My fascination with the possible discrepancies between experienced utility and decision utilities go back a long way. While Amos and I were still working on prospect theory, I formulated a puzzle which went like this. Imagine an individual who receives one painful injection every day. There is no ad adaptation. The pain is the same day to day. Will people attach the same value to reducing the number of planned injections from 20 to 18 as from 6 to 4? Is there any justification for, dis for a distinction? I did not collect the data because the outcome was evident. You can verify for yourself that you would pay more to reduce the number of injections by a third from 6 to 4 than, than by one tenth from 20 to 18. The decision utility of avoiding two rejections is higher in the first case than in the second and, of, and everyone will pay more for the first reduction than for the second. But this difference is absurd. If the pain does not change from day to day, what could justify assigning different utilities to a reduction of the total amount of pain by two injections? Depending on the number of previous injections in the terms we would use today, the puzzle introduced the idea that experience utility could be measured by the number of injections. I also suggested that at least in some cases, experience utility is the criterion by which a decision should be assessed. A decision maker who pays difficult amounts to achieve the same gain of experience utility or be spared the same loss is making a mistake. You may find this observation obvious, but in decision theory, the only basis for judging that a decision is wrong is inconsistency with other preferences. Amos and I discussed the problem, but we did not pursue it. Many years later, I returned to it. Experience and memory. How can experience utility be measured? How should we answer questions such as how much pain did Helen suffer during the medical procedure or how much enjoyment did she get from her 20 minutes on the beach? The British economist Francis Ed. Edgeworth speculated about this topic in the 19th century and proposed the idea of a hedonometer, an imaginary instrument analogous, analogous, I think it's analogous, 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 uh, analogous to the device used in weather recording stations, which would measure the level of pleasure or pain that an individual experiences at any moment. Experience utility would vary much as daily temperature or barometric pressure uh, or barometric pressure do and the results would be plotted as a function of time the answer to the question of how much pain or pleasure helen experienced during her medical procedure or vacation would be the area under the curve time plays a critical role in edward's conception if helen stays on the beach for 40 minutes instead of 20 and her enjoyment remains as intense then the total experience utility of the people i'm oh, sorry uh Reversed. Okay, if Helen is intense, then the total experience utility of that episode doubles. Actually, I'm going to have to say that whole thing again, so I don't lose train of thought. Uh, the answer to the question of how much pain or pleasure Helen experienced during her medical procedure or vacation would be the area under the curve. 
Time plays a critical role in Edgeworth's conception. If Helen stays on the beach for 40 minutes instead of 20 and her enjoyment remains as intense, then the total experience utility of that episode doubles just as doubling the number of injections make, makes a course of injection twice as bad. This was Edgeworth's theory, and we now have a precise understanding of the conditions under which his theory holds. The graph in figure 15 shows, shows profiles of the experience of two patients undergoing a painful colonoscopy drawn from a study that Don Redelmeyer and I designed together. Redelmeyer, a physician and researcher at the University of Toronto, carried it out in the early 1990s. This procedure is now routinely administered with an anesthetic as well as an amnesic drug. But these drugs were not as widespread when our data were collected. The patients were prompted every 60 seconds to indicate the level of pain they experience at the moment. The data shown are all data shown are on a scale where zero is no pain at all and ten is intolerable pain. As you can see, the experience of each patient varied considerably during the procedure, which lasted eight minutes for patients A and 24 minutes. For patient B, the last reading of a zero pain was recorded after the end of the procedure. A total of 154 participated in the experiment. The shortest procedure lasted four minutes, uh, the longest 69 minutes. Next, consider an easy question. Assuming that the two patients use a scale of pain similarly, which patient suffered more? No contest. There is general agreement that the patient B had the worst time. Patient B spent least much time as patient A, and it in oh my god. Uh, patient B spent at least as much time as patient A at any level of pain, and the area under the curve is clearly larger for B than for A. The, okay, so here, here's the graphs. I don't know if that's good enough. It's obviously 0 to 10. Uh, it goes up to 20, actually. So 0 to 10, so it goes, uh, what is this, y-axis or x-axis? So I can't remember. Is this x-axis? I can't remember, shit. People are going to kill me for this. So, I think this is the y axis and this is the x axis, obviously, right? I don't know. But let me see. Let me Google that quickly. Y axis. Uh, let me just double check for you guys because I'm stupid sometimes. It's the night. Don't judge me. Uh, y axis, yeah. This is y axis, x axis. Okay. Um, so, basically, you know. Y axis up to 10 and X axis go to 20 in time. Uh, the Y axis is pain intensity and the X axis is time intensity. We're comparing the patients A and B. And obviously, the patient B experienced more pain than patient A. Uh, probably equivalent intensity levels, but not as much pain. Uh, the key factor, of course, is that B's procedure lasted much longer. I will call the measures based on reports of momentary pain hedonomity oh, totals. When the procedure was over, all participants were asked to rate the total amount of pain they had experienced during the procedure. The wording was intended to encourage them to think of the inter integral of the pain they had reported, reproducing the hedonometer, I hate that word, hedonometer totals. Surprisingly, the patients did nothing of the kind. The statistical analysis revealed two findings which illustrate a pattern we have observed in other experiments. Peak end rule. The global retrospective rating was well predicted by the average of the level of pain reported at the worst moment of the experience and at its end. Let me repeat that one more time. Peak end rule. <clears throat> the global retrospective rating was well predicted by the average of the level of the pain reported at the worst moment of the experience at, and at its end. During duration neglect, the duration of the procedure had no effect whatsoever on the ratings of the total pain. You can now apply these rules to the profiles patient A and B. The worst ratings, 8 on the 10 point scale, was the same for both patients. But the last rating before the end of the procedure was 7 for patient A and only 1 for patient B. The peak and end average was therefore 7.5 for patient A and only 4.5 for patient B. As expected, patient A retained a much worse memory of the episode than patient B. Interesting. 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 It was the bad luck of patient A that the procedure ended at a bad moment, leaving him with an unpleasant memory. We now have an embarrassment of riches. Two measures of experience utility. The hedonometer told the hedonometer. It's hedonometer total and the retrospective assessment that are systematically different.
The hedonomy totals are computed by an observer from an individual's report of the experiences of moments. We call these judgment duration weighted because the computation of the area under the curve assigns equal weights to all moments. Two minutes of pain at level nine is twice as bad as one minute at the same level of pain. However, the findings of this experiment and others show that the retrospective assessment are insensitive to duration and weight to singular moments, the peak and, and the end much more than the others. So which should matter? What should, be physician, what should the physician do? The choice has implications for medical practice. We noted that if the objective is to reduce patient's memory of pain, lowering the peak intensity of pain could be more important than minimizing the duration of the procedure. By the same reasoning, gradual relief may be preferable to abrupt relief if patients retain a better memory when the pain at the end of the procedure is relatively mild. Interesting, no. So that's like, well, that's, that's a deep thing. If the objective is to reduce the amount of pain actually experienced, conducting the procedure swiftly may be appropriate, even if doing so increased the peak pain intensity and leaves patients with an awful memory. Interesting. So the amount of pain will actually leave an awful memory. So like PTSD. Interesting. Okay, that's very interesting. So level of pain equals awful awful memory okay which of the two objectives did you find most compelling i have not conducted a proper survey but my impression is that a strong majority will come down in a favor of reducing the memory of pain i find it helpful mm, to think of its dilemma as a conflict of interest between two selves which do not correspond to the familiar systems the experiencing self is the one that answers the question does it hurt now the remembering self is the one that answers the question, how was it on the whole? Memories are all we get to keep from our experience of living and the only perspective that we can adopt as we think about our lives is therefore that of the remembering self. Whoa, dude, this is super deep, man. A comment I heard from a member of the audience after a lecture illustrates the difficulty of distinguishing memories from experiences. He told of listening rapidly to a long symphony on a disc that was scratched near the end, producing a shocking sound, and he reported that the bad ending ruined the whole experience, but the experience was not actually ruined, only the memory of it. Yo, dude, this is the, some good shit right here. Jesus, this is really good. The experiencing self had an experience, the experienced self, the experiencing self had, had an experience that was almost entirely good and the bad end could not undo it because it had already happened. My questioner had assigned the entire episode of failing grade because it had ended very badly, but that grade effectively ignored 40 minutes of musical bliss. Does the actual experience count for nothing? Confusing experience with the memory of its, uh, confusing experience with the memory of it is a compelling cognitive illusion. And it is the substitution that makes us believe a past experience can be ruined. The experiencing self does not have a voice. The remembering self is sometimes wrong. Experiencing self. Experience self. Um, but it is the one that keeps score and governs what we learn from living. And is the one that makes decision. What we learn from the past is to maximize the qualities of our future memories not necessarily of our future experience. This is the tyranny of remembering self. So you have two versions of experience self and remembering self. Obviously, remembering self is the ego self, whereas the actual self is us experiencing. Let me say, which self, which self, <laughs> which self should count? To demonstrate the decision-making power of the remembering self, my colleagues and I designed an experiment using a mild form of torture that I will call the cold hand situation. Its ugly technical name is cold pressure. Uh, cold pressure. Uh, cold presser. Uh, there we go. Participants are asked to hold their hand up to up to the wrist in painfully cold water until they are invited to remove it and are offered a warm towel. The subjects in our experiments use their free hand to control arrows on a keyboard to provide a continuous record of the pain they were enduring. 
I direct communication from the experiencing self. We choose a temperature that caused moderate but tolerable pain. The volunteer participants were, of course, free to remove their hand at any time, but none chose to do so. Each participant endured two cold hand episodes. The short episode consisted of 60 seconds of immersion in water at 14 degrees Celsius, which is experienced as painfully cold but not intolerable. At the end of the 60 seconds, the experiment instructed the participants to remove his hand from the water and offered a warm towel. The long episode lasted 90 seconds. Its first 60 seconds were identical to the short episode. The experiment said nothing at all at the end of the 60 seconds. Instead, he opened a valve that allowed slightly warmer water to flow into the tub. During the additional 30 seconds, the temperature of the water rose by roughly 1 degrees, just enough for the most subjects to detect a slight decrease in the intensity of pain. Our participants were told that they would have three cold hand trials, but in fact, they experienced only the short and the long episodes, each with a different hand. The trials were separated by seven minutes. Seven minutes after the second trial, the participants were given a choice about the third trial. They were told that one of the experiences would be repeated exactly uh, exactly, and were free to choose whether to repeat the experience they had with their left hand or with their right hand. Of course, half the participants had the short trial with the left hand, half with the right. Half had the short trial first, half began with the long, etc. This was carefully controlled experiment. The experiment was designed to create a conflict between the interest of experiencing and the remembering selves and also between experience utility and decision utility. From the perspective of experiencing uh, self, the long trial was obviously worse. We expected the remembering self to have another opinion. The peak and rule predicts a worse memory for the short than for the long trial. And duration neglect predict that the difference between 90 seconds and 60 seconds of pain will be ignored. We therefore predicted that the participants would have a more favorable or less unfavorable memory of the long trial and choose to repeat it. They did fully 80% of the participants who reported that their pain diminished during the final phase of the longer episode opted to repeat it, thereby declaring themselves willing to suffer 30 seconds of needless pain in the anticipated third trial. The subjects who preferred the long episode were not masochists. I don't know how to say this word, masochists? Masochists, like probably like pain seekers or some shit. I think Macasus maybe, Maso, masochists maybe, right? Ma they, they, <laughs> they weren't masochists. So how do you say it? Masochist. Masochists, yeah, they, were, they weren't masochists. Basically a person who derives sexual gratification from their own pain or human relation. Can you imagine? Oh yeah, that's cold, that's super cold. <laughs> Whatever, man. Uh, they were not masochists and did not deliberately choose to expose themselves to the worst experience. They simply made a mistake. If we had asked them, would you prefer a 90 second immersion or only the first part of it, they would certainly have selected the short, the short option. We did not use these words, however, and the subjects did what came naturally. They chose to repeat the episode of which they had less aversive memory. The subject knew quite well which of the two exposures was longer, we asked them, but they did not use that knowledge. The decision was governed by a simple rule of intuitive choice. Pick the option you like the most or dislike the least. Rules of memory determined how much they disliked the two options, which in turn determined their choice. The cold hand experiment, like my old injection puzzle, revealed a discrepancy between decision utility <coughs> and experience utility. <coughs> the preferences we observed in this experiment are another example of the less is more effect that we have encountered on previous occasions. One was Christoph C's study in which adding dishes to a set of 24 dishes lowered the total value because some of the added dishes were broken. Another was Linda, the activist woman who is judged more likely to be a feminist bank teller than a bank teller. The similarity is not accidental. The same operating feature of System 1 accounts for all three situations. System 1 represents sets by averages, norms, and prototypes, not by sums. Each cold hand episode is a set of moments which the remembering self stores as a prototypical, prototypical moment. This leads to a conflict for an objective observer evaluating the episode from the reports of the experiencing self. What counts is the area under the curve that integrates pain over time. 
It has the nature of the sun. The memory that the remembering self keeps in contrast is a representative moment strongly influenced by the peak and the end. Of course, evolution could have designed animals' memory to store in integrals as it surely does in, same cases. Uh, in some cases. It is important for a squirrel to know the total amount of food it has stored and a representation of the average size of the nuts would not be a good substitute. However, the integral of pain or pleasure over time may be less biologically significant. We know, for example, that rat surgeration neglect for both pleasure and pain in one experiment, rat were consistently exposed to the sequence in which the onset of light signals that an electric shock will soon be delivered. The rats quickly learned to fear the light and the intensity of their fear could be measured by several physiological responses. The main finding was that the duration of the shock has little or no effect on fear. All that matters is the painful intensity of the stimulus. Other classic studies showed that the electrical stimulation of specific areas in the rat brain and of corresponding areas in the human brain's proceed. Um, sorry, uh, it's a lot of the line. Blah, blah, ling, 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 ling. Uh, other classic studies showed that electrical stimulation of specific areas in the rat brain and of corresponding areas in the human brain produce a sensation of intense pleasure. So intense in some cases that the rats who can stimulate their brain by pr pressing a lever or die of starvation without taking a break to feed themselves. Pleasurable electric stimulation can be delivered in bursts that vary intensity and duration. Here again, only intensity matters up to a point. Increasing the duration of a burst of stimulation does not appear to increase the eagerness of the animal to obtain it. The rules that govern the remembering self of humans have a long evolutionary history. Biolog biology versus rationality. The most useful idea in the ejection puzzle that preoccupied me years ago was the experience utility of a series of equally painful injections can be measured by simply counting the injections. If all injections are equally aversive, then 20 of them are twice as bad as 10, and the reduction from 20 to 18 and a reduction from 6 to 4 are equally valuable. If the decision utility does not correspond to the experience utility, then something is wrong with the decision. If, what did say? if the decision utility does not correspond to the experience utility, then something is wrong with the decision. Same logic played out in the cold hand experiment. An episode of pain that lasts 90 seconds is worse than the first 60 seconds of that episode. If people willingly choose to endure the longer episodes, something is wrong with the decision. In my early puzzle, the discrepancy between the decision and the experience originated from diminishing sensitivity. The difference between 18 and 20 is less impressive and appears to be worthless. When it appears to be worth less than the difference between six and four injections. In cold hand experiment, the error reflects two principles of memory, duration neglect and the peak end rule. The mechanisms are different, but the outcome is the same. A decision that is not correctly attuned to the experience. Decisions that do not produce the best possible experience er or erroneous forecasts of future feelings both are bad news for believers in the rationality of choice. The cold hand study showed that we cannot fully trust our preferences to reflect our interests. Even if they are based on personal experience and even if the memory of that experience was laid down within the last quarter of an hour, tastes and decisions are shaped by memories and the memories can be wrong. Interesting. The evidence presents a profound challenge to the idea that the humans have consistent preferences and know how to maximize them. And <clears throat> a cornerstone of the rational agent model, an inconsistency is built into the design of our minds. We have strong preferences. <coughs> we have strong preferences about the duration of our experiences of pain and pleasure. We want pain to be brief and pleasure to last, but our memory, our function of system one, has evolved to represent the most intense moment of an episode of pain or pleasure, the peak, and the feelings when the episode was at, it, was at its end. A memory that neglects duration will not serve our preference for long pleasure and short pains. Wow, that is crazy. So peak and ends. So literally, if you use the graph, 
right? Ching, ching. It's like imagine like a triangle without the line at the bottom. And uh, basically, the top part is what we remember the most, and and the end. So we don't care what the fuck happens, then, but we do remember the extreme pleasure, the extreme pain, and how it went away. That's interesting. Speaking of two selves, you are thinking of your failed marriage entirely from the perspective of remembering self. A divorce is like a symphony with a screeching sound at the end. The fact that it ended badly does not mean it was all bad. Oof, that's deep. <laughs> this is a bad case of duration neglect. You are giving the good and the bad part of your experience equal weight. Although the good part lasted in ten minutes, a lot. Although the good part lasted ten times as long as the other. Okay, so. We only remember the the best part and when it ended. So like literally, it's interesting because well, we remember the beginning. Uh, if I'm going back, let's say to a specific memory, I can't remember. I remember the, the okay. So obviously, when you have remember the extreme pleasure, that you can remember the the most intensity. So there would probably be like short bursts of intensities. And when those bursts ended, right? So the question is, okay, so it's not just one entire memory, it's many memories. Yeah, the ones that stayed with me the most are probably the ones that are the most intense and how they ended. Yeah, they do that. That's exactly, yeah. That's an interesting, um, <clears throat> that's very interesting. But he's saying that here that we have to distinguish for us what is better for us in the long term, in the long term, in the long term, sorry, in the long term uh, for us to gain the most, um, uh, most uh, pleasure and, worth, and least amount of pain. Interestingly enough, though, it's a weird reward and pain system. I'm trying to think because obviously you know when you're doing survival stuff why is it i mean it does it obviously it's negating for the short term long, long, longer than the long term because it's expect it doesn't know when it's going to die so it obviously goes for the short term interesting enough maybe that's the reason why because we we don't know when we're going to die so the best advantage is to have this feeling immediately to prevent any you know to give us motivation to live on at the same time and we obviously it's not thinking for in the future it can't so it's only thinking right now and backwards of what has happened and so it will keep those reference points those intensities in order for us to guide ourselves through the future but it also doesn't know <clears throat> when it's going to happen when it's going to die so obviously the intensity uh, kind of just gives you motivation in order to, you know, what's better, what's not. But it's he's saying that those, you know, those things that you felt were the best weren't really the best. Those were, you know, great feelings, but they weren't the actual, it wasn't all bad. Maybe they weren't as intense as that specific moment, but there were those moments before that, which was like, I mean, it, it's, you can, you know, look at it how you want um for now there's a lot of ways to think about this but it is an interesting <clears throat> point that we only remember the best part the most entertaining part and the most fun parts and the most painful parts when they are when at the most peak of intensity and when they end yeah that's great all right guys that's it that was chapter 35. <clears throat> See you in the next video. You know the you know the shigang, you know the shebangs. Like, subscribe, whatever. You know the shit. Leave your comments, blah blah blah. Bye bye.